So yeah, thanks for inviting me uh, and thanks for the introduction. Okay. So yeah, I want to talk today a bit about uh, conversations. Uh, uh, what are they and how this very central human interaction uh, can be used and can be relevant to animal uh, communication, if at all. Uh, so to start with a very general uh, definition, I'm not sure where I got it from, maybe even Wikipedia. Uh, so conversation is interactive communication between two or more people. Quite intuitive, uh, but in human culture, uh, it's considered to be a bit more than just uh, informational exchange. It's a lot about the interaction uh, between the parties. And if we think about it, uh, when we meet with a friend and then tell us about their day or their work, uh, do we really need that information? Do we really remember what we talked about a few months ago or a year ago? Or, but we, mostly we do remember that we met this person, we had some, uh, we sat with him, we talked with him about something. We kind of touched base, but uh, uh, the information in most cases kind of uh, getting, uh, getting lost with time. So uh, I guess in, in this context of casual conversations, the interaction is larger than the actual content uh, of, the, of, the, of the things that we talked about. And when uh, looking at some uh, papers about what people are actually converse about, uh, it seems that in most cases, just general social stuff uh, about ourselves, about other people, uh, kind of a bit, uh, a bit gossipy without a lot of functional things uh, that uh, uh, we might consider communication being uh, all about. And the suggestion was that those interactions, those conversational meetings that we have, are uh, generally about servicing social relationships, uh, about uh, ensuring the smooth running of a social group, uh, maybe a bit of self-promotion, uh, depending on the culture. Uh, but the information we exchange is not as crucial as, uh, as, as we think. And now a few criteria were suggested uh, to kind of define more formally what is the conversation type uh, interaction. Uh, so first of all is uh, reciprocal turns or turn taking. Uh, participants are avoiding overlap. They're tr we're trying to anticipate when the next person is about to, uh, to finish his turn and kind of prepare ourselves in order to fit in this gap and avoid awkward pauses, but also avoid uh, talking together with the other uh, participants. Uh, the interaction is more or less uh, between uh, defined parties, uh, as in, in contrast to kind of a more general announcement or speeches that are going away to as many people as possible. When we uh, converse, we address specific person or specific group of individuals. Uh, continuity is also an important aspect, uh, and uh, there are several exchange turns that uh, are going on, and uh, we actually invest a lot of effort in making this uh, conversation going, in making this interaction going. Uh, we can add detail, we can exaggerate, we do expect the other, uh, the other parties to respond and to contribute to have this thing uh, not being just a question and answer, something very, very limited in time. And uh, the last one is uh, the progression within a sequence. So there is a sort of a direction. Uh, I mean, it's not just repetition. Uh, we respond to the previous signal, and then it's progressing in that, uh, in that matter. And uh, so the signals are changing dependent on the ones that have uh, been said before. And so as conversations were suggested to be uh, the very essence of human communication, there were few attempts to try and uh, see if they can be traced back, that social interaction, can it be, can it, can it be traced back to animal ancestry? 
and a lot of uh, push forward was uh, done following uh, some of the some of Robin Dunbar's uh, works uh, that, among other things, uh, uh, talked about animal vocal exchanges uh, being sort of an equivalent of physical uh, grooming. And now, beside, besides the hygienic function of grooming, of uh, removing parasites, it also has a social function of kind of maintaining uh, social bonds within a group. And uh, Robin Dunbar suggested that vocal exchanges have a very similar function, uh, but allow bonding with more individuals. And, uh, and this make it basically made the parallel to the social functions of our own uh, conversations. Uh, now, of course, there is no animal equivalent to the complexity and the hierarchical structure of human language. Uh, but if it's mainly about interaction and mainly about bonding, uh, maybe uh, a much smaller, a much simpler signal would still work. Now, the social function of vocal exchanges in animals have been shown in a few species. There, these are just uh, three uh, kind of random examples, but in uh, all the works, all the papers that I found, uh, turn taking and partner selectivity according to some social uh, parameter was always present. Uh, there, was, there were less attempts to try and tick the boxes of continuity and progression uh, within a sequence. They might be less important. Uh, I don't know. My personal feeling that at least continuity and persistence should play a major role. I mean, uh, we do see that persistence of signaling is important for uh, mating relating, mating related uh, uh, bonds, for establishing mating related bonds. So I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be the case with general social bonds as well. And uh, but there are a few challenges for uh, generating this vocal exchange interactions. Uh, first is a signal coordination. Uh, how do we know where the other party is about to finish their turn? Uh, how do we know when they're about to start their turn? And again, if we're looking at humans, we are uh, paying attention to a series of quite subtle cues uh, from, other, from other people. We're looking at body posture, we're looking at intonation, we're looking at breathing, and uh, subconsciously anticipate uh, when uh, it will be an opportunity for us uh, to, to get into that gap. Uh, but it is unclear uh, on what level this, this is regulated in animals. Uh, another issue is partner recognition. Uh, what is my preference? Who I interact with? Uh, the, the individuals that I have stronger bonds with or individuals that I have weaker bonds with? Uh, where is the balance? And uh, what is the benefit of maintaining an existing one, existing bond, existing friendship, uh, or uh, kind of trying to establish uh, uh, a weaker one. And the third question is uh, the famous cocktail party problem. And uh, it's basically if we have a bunch of people in a room and everyone is speaking, uh, how do we manage to maintain this communication and link with a specific partner? Do we only manage to do it in a kind of spatially uh, proximate niche? Uh, or uh, can we kind of generate sort of a code that will allow us to uh, secure a channel uh, that will we'll be able to communicate with somebody who is slightly further away, uh, but this code will uh, make those signals of this specific partner more recognizable. They will, uh, it will make them stand out from uh, the general, uh, general noise that we're hearing. Uh, so I'm uh, looking at some of those questions in animals, not in humans. And as a starting point, we need to find uh, those vocal exchanges, those events when we have a calling group. And from the first uh, look, 
which looks like most of the individuals are making calls, uh, but we can distinguish between two cases. A case where uh, they're all just calling as a result uh, of some external event, and their calls are not directly dependent on one another, and a an, uh, situation when this group vocal signature is actually consisting of local interactions of individuals uh, communicating between themselves, uh, but from kind of a general overview, it's uh, hard to, uh, to distinguish between those, uh, uh, those two states. So uh, this work is uh, done together with uh, Mara, Batiste, uh, Marta Manser from uh, Zurich and uh, Ari, and uh, with a lot of help of uh, people that assisted in the field, uh, Beck, Pauline, Chini, and uh, Walter from the Kalahari Mirkat project. Uh, now, the main study system that we work uh, with uh, are uh, Mirkats. And Mirkats are a great uh, model for uh, communication and uh, sociality studies. Uh, they're very social, they have a very large and nicely defined vocal repertoire. Uh, these are just a few examples of the calls that they make. Basically, most of their daily activity is accompanied by some sort of vocal signal. And uh, the groups stay together most of the time. There are some group splits, there are some individuals going roving here and there, but really most of the, most of the day, the group is uh, staying in a very defined areas. Uh, now this is a wild population from the Kalahari Meerkat project in, uh, in South Africa. Uh, this is a population that's been monitored for the last 20 years. Individuals are marked, their life histories are known, and they're very well habituated uh, to the level that we can approach them uh, uh, and uh, color most of the individuals in the group without trapping, without immobilizing them in any way. If we, uh, being, if we are slow and careful enough, we can just approach and kind of gently snap the color on the group, on, on, the, on, the, on most of the individuals. So this color is uh, including a GPS, uh, collecting data at one hertz, and an audio an audio recorder uh, that records continuously. The data collection window is defined, so it will uh, record for three hours during the foraging period of the group, and those three hours can be in the morning or in the afternoon, but three hours uh, each day over a course of a week or so. And so at the end, uh, the output of the data is that we have the tr movement, movement trajectories of all individuals and the calls of individually identified calls from each one of the meerkats. And it's all aligned on the same timeline. On the same timeline, we know which individual produced the call at what point in time and in what point in space. Uh, now, from all the different meerkat call types, I want to focus on two uh, for, for today. Uh, close calls and short note calls. Uh, these are the most frequent call types in our data set. They're about 80% of the data. Uh, now, clo close calls are individually distinctive. They're mostly produced while the group is foraging. And uh, in a foraging meerkat group, individuals are uh, known to kind of follow the hotspot of the close calls. Uh, the denser area went from, uh, from where the calls are uh, made. And the function is uh, thought to be kind of to avoid separation, to keep the group uh, together. Uh, interestingly, when there are pups in the group, uh, the close call rates are going down. Uh, now, meerkat pups are incredibly noisy. Uh, they make uh, f uh, begging calls all the time, creating a lot, of, um, a lot of background for the group. And it might be that this kind of constant acoustic jamming 
prevents uh, this close call system from functioning. Individuals can hear others, they don't produce the calls themselves, and so the pups are kind of disturbing this whole, uh, uh, this whole acoustic uh, location system. So uh, the social monitoring of other uh, individuals in the group and the sensitivity to in interference uh, may, they make, make close calls a good candidate for a bidirectional exchange. If it's dependent on call and response dynamics, it might not function if there are a lot of noise in the area. And this is how it looks in real life. Uh, the next call type is uh, the short note. Uh, short notes are also individually distinctive, uh, but they have a much more, uh, much higher variety in the context of their production. Uh, we can hear short notes when there is an individual going on sentinel duty, uh, when there is a submission interaction between uh, meerkats. Uh, we hear a lot of short note calls when meerkats are sunning, uh, when they emerge from the burrow and kind of stand and warm up Warm, warm in the sun before they start foraging, they all emit those short note calls. Uh, they also emit them when the group is running, really during fast uh, movement. And in all those contexts, the acoustic structure is quite similar. We cannot really distinguish between short notes from different contexts uh, without uh, having some additional information. Just by looking at the spectrograms and f uh, hearing the calls, they look uh, and sound exactly the same. Uh, another uh, interesting detail about short note calls uh, in uh, that if, uh, in the past, Ari and I uh, looked at signing short note calls and uh, we showed that they, uh, they do not overlap. Uh, the uh, time point zero here on the, on the plot showing low levels of overlap uh, between different individuals uh, when uh, we took the times of, the, of calls of one individual and uh, kind of uh, artificially shifted them uh, back and forth, we've seen that the overlap rates are, uh, are spiking up, and that's the curve on the left or, or uh, on the right. So they do seem to be actually avoiding uh, kind of calling together with other uh, meerkats at the same time and uh, tend to turn take during the... Uh, during the signing interaction, during the signing behavior. And again, this is the signing. They stand, they warm in the sun for about uh, 40 minutes, an hour, uh, before they start their uh, daily activity. Now let's look at short notes at the foraging context. The same call, different behavior context. And uh, this is a slightly different analysis, uh, but what this uh, plot is showing us is uh, calls of neighbors at, at a two meter radius. So we take a time of an individual call here at time zero and look at the call rates of neighbors uh, before and after. And basically that peak at time zero uh, telling us that uh, they call more or less simultaneously. They overlap and uh, we don't see those interactions that we've seen in the signing context anymore. Uh, when we uh, open this radius a bit and look at uh, slightly uh, uh, increase the distance, we see that the peak is still here until more or less five meters and uh, further than that there is no pattern. We don't see any uh, uh, any any calling that is dependent uh, on the previous on, on the on the focal one uh, beyond that five meter uh, range, and so uh, there is some local behavior context, uh, but we don't see any individual uh, interactions going on there. And now exactly the same analysis, but now with the close calls, and here the situation is completely different. We see the two peaks on uh, more or less 0.3 seconds from the focal call. 
So after the focal is calling, there is a high probability that a neighbor will call in 0 .6, 0 0.3 seconds after. So we, now we do see that call and response dynamics, uh, but again, the spatial range is still about five meters, so that might be the distance that is perceived as socially relevant for a meerkat, at least in, the, in, these, uh, in this context. And now just, again, to make a clear comparison, both those plots uh, together, uh, we have the short notes with the overlapping uh, calling and the close calls and, and the close calls with the call and response patterns. And the five meters is similar for both. So we're likely seeing two different signaling modes here. Uh, sort of broadcast signaling with uh, the group is calling generally uh, uh, to a contextual uh, uh, event and an interactive or, or um, conversational dynamics of individuals kind of communicating di directly or with their neighbors or with, with other individuals specifically. And uh, interestingly, the same call type can function in both signaling modes. So if you're looking at short note calls, the same calls acoustically, but given at, uh, at a different coordination levels in those uh, two situations. I mean, we still need to wrap the short note call analysis uh, together in uh, kind of in a, in, in a single, in a similar, uh, in a similar plots. Uh, but those two pieces of the puzzle seem to kind of fit together and uh, uh, showing that uh, short note calls are part of conversational type interactions and functionally in the signing contest we do think that they are uh, fulfilling that criteria of being, uh, of being kind of a bonding interaction. Uh, to test this, we performed a series of playback experiments when we played uh, calls of uh, group members, two individual uh, meerkats in the field, and we're now analyzing their responses. Uh, now, this is something uh, preliminary. There's uh, more data that needs to go into this plot. But, but what basically we're seeing that uh, call rate on the y-axis is actually is higher for individuals with weaker social ties on the x-axis. And uh, it, sounded, it was kind of counterintuitive for me because I, ex I expected the opposite. I expected that strongly bonded individuals will have more intense uh, interactions. Uh, but just a few weeks ago, a practically identical result was showed in dolphins with uh, weakly bonded individuals showing uh, stronger uh, strong, stronger intensity of vocal exchanges. And the explanation for this might be that uh, there is a reason to invest more in the weaker ties. I mean, uh, meerkats are, can hardly be called egalitarian, but uh, they have quite a steep hierarchy with dominant and parent subordinate individuals. Uh, but generally, there are few examples that more equal distribution of social ties is uh, promoting a, a longer life expectancy and better distribution of resources. So that might be the driver behind this preference for uh, communicating with individuals that are, I'm less friends with to kind of equalize my social niche. Uh, one more thing that we want to do, hopefully this summer, is to see if uh, the selection of the interaction partner can be proactive. I mean, for now, we only looked at meerkats that are already standing uh, one by the other uh, or by playing a playback from very close proximity, but uh, can they actively change their position and go and exchange calls with uh, someone they kind of need to improve their relationship with? And, and an alternative option would be that they're just 
kind of randomly shifting partners, uh, maximizing the number of uh, different, uh, oops, of different uh, interactions. Uh, but I mean, the nature of uh, each specific call exchange could be different depending on the kind of relative benefit of interacting with this specific uh, group member. Uh, now, another topic that I want to tell, uh, talk about, and this is dealing with cues indicating the intention to produce a call. Uh, basically touching the idea of how to coordinate between individuals and avoid uh, this uh, overlapping the calls of others. Uh, kind of to smooth the interaction. And now this part is done with the collaboration with Marta from Marta Manser from Zurich and Glenn uh, Tarasal. And so uh, just a bit of a background. Uh, most mammals produce calls on the exhale. Uh, so in order to call, we need to first inhale, and then air is pushed from the lungs, powering the vocal folds and uh, generating the sound. And usually we need slightly deeper inhale to, uh, to talk. Uh, how much deeper? Uh, well, in humans, it often depends on the length, on the duration of the things that we want to say. We usually try and uh, inhale enough air to finish a sentence or at least stop at some uh, logical point for, uh, to, take, uh, to, next, to take the next breath. And those changes in breathing uh, are actually detectable uh, by others. And uh, sometimes we can identify a person preparing to say something by the, uh, the depth of the breathing that uh, that person is taking. Uh, now, uh, we thought about taking this uh, physiological process and trying to, in, and to try and see if those breathing cues can also function in animals to regulate their interactions. And even more interestingly would be to see if uh, if we can identify failed calling attempts. Uh, there, was a, there was an intention to call, but something got in the way, and uh, this call never happened. And so the first part of this project was very recently published. Uh, what we were trying to do is look for a easy, relatively easy and non-invasive way to monitor uh, breathing. Uh, we did not want to put uh, uh, complex uh, logger harnesses or implant uh, respiration loggers into the animals. We wanted to do something external, and thermal imaging uh, looked promising for that. And uh, the principle is that the temperature of the nostril is changing during breathing. We inhale cooler air, we exhale warmer air from the lungs. And those differences can be detected uh, by the thermal camera. And uh, the breathing curve can be kind of approximated uh, from the, the, these temperature changes. Uh, so Glenn, uh, the collaborator from uh, Brock Uni in Canada, and I, we spent a few, a few weeks in the field uh, filming meerkats with a thermal cam and recording their signing calls. And now there are a few technical limitations to this method. Uh, so first of all, the ambient temperature has to be relatively low. Uh, if the air temperature and the temperature of the animal are uh, more or less the same, it will be very hard to get the differences in temperature between the inhale and the exhale. And the other issue is that thermal cameras, uh, for some reason, do not record sound. Uh, so we had to uh, record sound separately and sync the audio and the thermal feed uh, using this uh, very elaborate method of flipping a lighter and getting the click and the heat signature on the camera. Uh, but, well, it worked. Uh, we collected videos, we tracked uh, the nostrils of the meerkat uh, using a loopy uh, pose estimation tool and uh, measured the pixel density in the area of interest, converted this into temperature, 
And uh, when combining everything together, we're getting the respiration curve of an animal uh, we hear uh, on the bottom and the audio, uh, the calls that we, the waveform here on the left. So when temperature is going down, that's an ex inhale. When temperature is going up, that's an exhale. And it's, you see the breathing is uh, more or less stable. And just before the call, there's a bigger dip and a higher, uh, higher peak. And the recovery after a call is uh, also shorter. So again, those arrows here are the points when uh, calls were, uh, were produced. You see, a larger inhale before producing a call, higher pressure uh, of pushing the air out uh, when calling. And this results in faster uh, and shorter recovery until the next breathing cycle. And uh, just want to say thank you to Carla for getting the for giving me the idea of combining this in one in one video. <laughs> so respiration irregularities are starting before uh, active uh, call time emission. Uh, there is a small time window. Uh, but it might uh, be useful for identifying uh, those preparations, those intentions to produce uh, a call. And now these calls are quite short and quite uh, um, uh, not so loud. Uh, maybe with longer call sequences or louder calls, we'll see a much bigger, much bigger change. But even with the faint meerkat calls, we see that the normal respiration cannot accommodate this, uh, this need for a higher uh, pressure for powering the vocal cords. And uh, another interesting result that we uh, got from this data is that when neighbors are calling, the, fo the breathing of focal individual is getting uh, slower. And uh, I don't have a definite explanation of why this is happening. Uh, there are two options that uh, for now we thought about it. Uh, first of all, it could be attention. Uh, there is uh, a possibility that the animal is kind of trying to reduce the internal noise to uh, improve the perception of the auditory signal that is coming in. Another uh, option is relating to the function of the proposed function of this of the uh, sunning calls at least. This is the appeasing effect. If there is some uh, relaxation uh, during this uh, call interaction, hearing calls of others might cause this slowdown of breathing. But again, we yet don't know how to um, how to show that exactly. Uh, now, the plan for next step is to record pairs of animals with uh, the, the tracking of the respiration and now actually see if first this is, can be used as a cue, if preparations to call in, uh, in, uh, in a neighbor will kind of suppress the calls of, uh, of, of the other individual. And uh, another idea is again, to detect those failed calling attempts by looking at breathing and then uh, associating what have caused this individual to change, this mind, to change its mind. Why this meerkat, having full intentions to produce a call, didn't do it in the end. I mean, it would be cool to see what level of regulation they have uh, for avoiding overlap and basically for having this whole interaction going in an orderly manner. Uh, now, before summing up, I want to talk a bit about continuity. So if you go back to physical grooming, uh, grooming is a slow process. Uh, now, I have a only very basic knowledge about uh, the hormonal regulation and the neural processes that are uh, acting uh, in elicitating this uh, a feeling of pleasure and attachment following the tactile stimulation of grooming. Uh, but uh, from what I managed to, uh, to read, it takes time. It takes time until uh, the effect accumulates. 
And also, uh, the grooming needs to be done in a certain certain pace to have it uh, to, be, to be more efficient and initiate those uh, those effects. And uh, and this is actually one suggested limitation for physical grooming. It uh, it's 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 time it's time costly. If you have a larger group, you need to invest a specific amount of time for each individual. You cannot just cover uh, everybody. You eventually, have to do other things. And so, uh, acoustic interactions uh, with the same gro grooming function can solve some of these some of these difficulties. Uh, but it might require continuity as well, again, to elicitate those uh, hormonal and neural uh, 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 processes. So uh, we did not test this with our data, uh, but there are several options for maintaining this link uh, of communication with specific partners uh, over uh, longer, uh, long, longer time scales, again, within a group. And the, the options are changing the acoustics of the signal or changing the syntax, maybe changing the rhythm for generating this kind of channel, this specific code for uh, continuing the conversation despite being slightly away and having other individuals calling uh, in, in the surroundings. But again, just an idea for now. So, uh, well, going back to the slide that I, the title slide of animal conversations, uh, when, what, and who, I kind of anticipate the question of, well, why? I mean, why uh, there's a need to make this parallel? Uh, there are vocal interactions. Uh, some of them have similar properties, but uh, there's probably a huge variation in, uh, uh, depending on the environment, uh, on the modality. I mean, I'm clearly biased towards the, towards the acoustic signaling, but it can be any other, any other type of signal. Uh, it could, can be gestural, it can be uh, olfactory. And, uh, but this is actually the reason why I think this is a useful framework because it's less about uh, the complexity of the information. It's about, less about the channel of, the, the, of how the information is transferred and more about the, uh, the interaction and the dynamics of the timeline of the, of the interaction. And another aspect is that uh, those conversation type uh, interactions they require at least some level of intentionality. And this is a debatable topic, at least in animal communication still. It is not uh, fully established how intentional are, uh, how aware the animals for that they, they transmit information, they receive information. And, but persistence and kind of the flexibility for adjustment that is needed for uh, kind of keeping uh, this interaction going, I think it requires uh, some attention, it requires some awareness of the state of the receiver. And if we look uh, at enough detail at those, uh, at those interactions, we can better define those capabilities in animals. So uh, yeah, that's all, I don't know how much how much I'm in time. Just, yeah, just thank you for listening and all the different funders and <laughs> organizations. Yeah, so I, uh, thanks for the great talk. I was wondering about the individual identifiability of the call. You said they're individually distinct. Yeah. So uh, could that be like uh, constantly calling your name kind of to inform others about your positioning or how would you uh, conceptualize it? Or could you also address specific others and could you find this out by via their interaction? So basically if I call your name mm -hmm. that you would approach me or direct your attention towards me, uh, uh, is there any sign of that? And, uh, 
So I, we don't know about that in, uh, in, in meerkats specifically. Uh, there are some evidence uh, in, uh, in bats, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, I think in dolphins, that they do have some, uh, some type of call that it is kind of identifying myself. Uh, so it is an option. Uh, I, I think that short notes would be a better candidate for that. As, I mean, they are quite simple in terms of ac their acoustics. Uh, and I'm not sure how much, inf uh, well, we, we never know how information is actually encoded in those calls. But it seems that uh, they have much more capacity for transmitting the identity than uh, any other uh, like motivational uh, information. But yeah, but I mean, the, the, short, the short answer is I don't know. <laughs> Are you considering to find this out via the interaction? So you, you do have the GPS data yeah. and, and you have the call data, so you could basically see via the reaction of the individuals? So they do respond differently to calls of different individuals. Mm -hmm. So I think it's safe to assume to say that they recognize which, who is that individual. Uh, I'm. So, I, I mean, it, it can be enough. You don't have to say your name if I identify your voice, right? Sure, yeah. So that, that can function on the same level. And, uh, but it would be, the, the thing that we're trying to do this summer is to see if they will actually, they will actively go and approach this individual, either by, but that will be harder to see if they just hear it or they do, do they see it and then they go and, and interact with so, it. So in terms, of, so basically you expect the timeline I call, and then you approach me. Or Maybe, yes, I, yes. Yeah. E either you call and they approach you, or you don't call, but I, then I approach you because I see you. I guess that would be the, the test then, what, what goes first. Thanks. So I was wondering if already with your data, if, you already, if your data that yeah. you already have available, if, it's, uh, if you already can see some temporal pattern between uh, who is uh, like, is there always the same, like if you have a pair, A and B, yeah. if it's always A starting and B responding, or if it's always, uh, if you could have, have things like that? Yes. Uh, so there, there are definitely individual tendencies. I don't have these plots here, but when we're kind of looking at those pairs, we see that some individuals are kind of m more of a follower. They, they mostly respond to others, and some are more balanced, and some are just initiated interactions. Uh, we couldn't um, figure out if there is something with the social status or the sex. It, it, I mean, it might be something very personal. It is not related to one of the kind of characteristics that we try to look at. But yes, it's a thing. I don't have a good explanation of why exactly. Okay, but you already see a pattern. Sorry? You already see a pattern. Yeah, we, yes. see, we see a pattern. We can't explain it. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. My question is quite similar, but I was wondering if um, all meerkats use the same calls or if there are some specific calls for younger meerkats or for older or do, so um, do they have to learn these calls mm -hmm. first and see them when to use them afterwards? Yeah, so I personally didn't look at uh, call ontogeny specifically. Uh, I know there's some work being done uh, on that in, in Zurich. Uh, so I can I, I can't say about the close calls that they definitely change with age, and uh, they kind of become more defined. And when the, when they're younger, they uh, much more variable and they vary in length, slightly vary in frequency, getting uh, a bit weird. Uh, but when they're uh, getting to like year and a half, two years, they're uh, already uh, much more stereotyped. Uh, about short notes, I, 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 I don't know, because uh, we only recorded adults. Uh, but I mean, I hope that uh, the work that they're doing in Zurich will kind of give us a better answer for that. Thank you so much. We have a question from the chat yeah. by Janine Gruta. Hello, Janine. Thank you so much. 
Um, she said she writes, thank you very much for your talk. You talked about the tendency to signal more to weaker ties, which may be related to group functioning and fairness. Do you know whether this depends on the position of the animal in the group? For example, do the lower ones in the hierarchy send more signals, maybe to bond more with the group? Uh, ah, I don't remember. I don't think so. I think it was, from what I remember, I, I did this analysis a while ago. Uh, if I remember correctly, then uh, it was mainly about uh, kind of paired uh, relationship, not about uh, any kind of global rank of the individual. I think that's I think that's the case. I might need to double check it, but I, I am almost, almost sure that, that that was that. It was individual and not uh, group level. Thank you. Um, Janine, I hope that answers your question. If not, you can, of course, uh, write another line here. Also, uh, if there are any more questions in the chat. Yes, she says, OK, thanks. Then there's a um, question by uh, Nico, Nico Gradwol, thank you so much for the exciting talk related to the signaling to weaker ties. How would you think in which instances or by which processes this is related to group functioning and fairness? Oops. Uh, so I, I can't say about meerkats specifically. Uh, I, I did uh, encounter uh, similar uh, results in uh, the previous system that I worked with, with, uh, with rock hyraxes. And their uh, groups with more equal tide distribution, individuals had a longer life expectancy. And some of the suggestions that were made that uh, there's less conflict, there's better distribution of resources, food resources, and uh, I guess just less stress, that might be the reason. And uh, I mean, I, I think it's, again, it's, it's reasonable to say that it might, might be similar in meerkats, but we haven't tested this uh, directly. Thank you. Great, thanks. Are there any other questions? Christoph? Thanks. So I may be totally wrong because uh, I'm not an expert, but um, so it's for more for the why question. Uh, yeah, I think uh, in some in the evolution of human language, there are some theories that uh, postulate that uh, the origin is gestural rather than vocal at the origin. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in this case, maybe it would be also uh, so more vocal and maybe because uh, they are like meerkats when they forage, they are engaged with all their limbs on the ground, so maybe that's why it's, it's in this case, it's more uh, the vocal, it's just uh, an idea. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, that's the explanation what we're also thinking about. That they're just, uh, don't need to lift their head, and uh, it's, it's a much convenient channel for doing that. Yeah. So there's uh, another comment from mm -hmm. Eli Strauss. Yeah. Very nice talk. I'm curious about the relationship between complexity, brackets operationalized as var variability in call structure within types, and overlap turn taking. It seems that when all calls are communicating the same information and thus are very similar in structure, e.g. predator, overlap occurs and amplifies the signal. But in these sunning calls where calls are also very similar, there is very little overlap. Do you think it's possible to make some broad predictions about the relationship between call overlap and call complexity? I, uh, well, I think that uh, at least if we're looking at uh, sunning calls and the same short note calls that are uh, produced during foraging, they are the same call. And in one case they are overlapping, in other case they don't. So I, I think that's an example. It is not necessarily uh, this. I think it's, I'm not sure how to answer that kind of on, on the fly. Uh, I think the, 
kind of call complexity question is also a bit um, a bit tricky definition because if we're looking at uh, at a call as a unit or at a call uh, as a sequence that transmits the information, I think it's really hard to, to distinguish which one is more complex and which one is uh, less complex. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think maybe Elon and I can have a talk in the office later and uh, we can yeah, he says explain a bit better. <laughs> He says, thanks, that's a great point. <laughs> Are there any other questions or comments? We'll just wait a minute for the chat community to think it over. But it doesn't seem there are any more questions. So thank you, Vlad, again, very, very much. This was very <laughs> exciting. And uh, yeah, you deserve yeah. your <laughs> <laughs> thank you. praise and uh, the claps. <laughs>